I want to go on record that I've thought from almost the beginning of my career that comedians are worthless scum that only <laughs> think about themselves and where their next paycheck is coming from. Uh, Live from the Willie Nelson and Friends Museum Showcase in Nashville, Tennessee, it's Music is Funny. Musicians talking to comedians about music and comedy with your hosts, Raylan Nelson and Jonathan Bright. So smoking on so high. Back to Music is Funny. I'm Raylan Nelson. And I'm Jonathan Bright from the Raylan Nelson Band. Back with another ridiculous and unnecessary intro. What to- kind of intro? Unnecessary and ridiculous. Today we have one of our favorites. A Joe DeRosa. So what is the first... <laughs> what's the first music you remember loving as a kid? The very first. Um... Uh, pr- uh, I remember specific songs that, that jumped out at me when I was little, um, break my stride was one. I can't remember the guy's name that sang that. Um, but that's a classic 80s song. Um, Ghostbusters, the song Ghostbusters, the, but the first song I remember being like obsessed with, um, like where I sat by the radio with my mom to record it because that's how you had to get a song back then if you didn't go buy the whole record um was power of love by huey lewis and the news i remember seeing back to the future and i was obsessed with that song i couldn't you know but then the first record and i can't remember if this which came first the first record i was obsessed with was thriller michael jackson's thriller um and then the first song I truly remember being obsessed with was Power of Love. Um, I'm sure there were ones before that, but those are the two that leap out at me. But the first music I remember being obsessed with, because that stuff for me didn't go much past songs right. or a particular record, was rap music. When I, heard, when I heard hip-hop for the first time, I believe I was in second or third grade, um, I was like, oh, my God, like it changed. It just changed the way I looked at everything and continued to through my adult life. Um, And I remember begging my mom to take me to the mall so I could buy Run DMC's album Raising Hell. Oh, yeah. Um, And she knew there were curse words on it. She made me listen to the whole record with her. (laughs) How was that? That was not that bad. There's only two times they say fuck on the whole record, which is funny. I, I met DMC at a Comic-Con, or I'm sorry, not at a Comic-Con, at a, at, a, at a retro video game fest in California. He was there promoting his comic book. Um, and I met him, and I told him that story. And he was like, he was like, yeah, that's not so bad, though, man. There's only one fuck on it. And I go, no, there's two. And he was like, and he's like, wait, no, you dumb motherfuckers don't want to mess with us. He goes, what else? And I go, in the last song, I'm proud to be black. You say, I'm proud to be black, y'all. And that's a fact, y'all. And motherfucker, I could, I think the lyric is a motherfucker. I could never be a slave, y'all. And he was like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. That one. And I was like, yeah. And I was. That was back. That, when there, that was back when there weren't a lot of fucks flying around on rap records, anyway. So when you heard up until like oh. Live Crew came out, it was sort of they would sprinkle them in because I yeah. grew up listening to Public Enemy and you know the early Beastie Boys and all that stuff, and there really wasn't a whole lot of that kind of stuff on there. There was no stickers yet. Yeah, before the trials that that big the PMRC thing happened with you know with Frank Zappa and Tipper Gore and everything. So it wasn't that wasn't that weird listening to it, my ma. It's like. Yeah, it's it's a curse word, you know, and it's used for emphasis. The one that was awkward was the first stickered record I ever got was Ice T Power, and I almost wore that shirt today. So the cover, <laughs> the cover is. I should go try to grab the vinyl of it, but the I cover is the cover. I definitely remember yeah, the cover. it's him and DJ evil E and Darlene who was, who was the syndicate queen. His crew was called the rhyme syndicate and she was, she was his wife and they called her Darlene, the syndicate queen. And the, the front 
the the top half of the cover was them just standing like sort of nicely dressed she was in a very skimpy thing um and then the bottom half of the cover was them their image upside down reversed and they were all high concealing guns <laughs> so the cover was like sex and guns and um it, it, and it had an explicit lyric sticker on it and that one my mom was also like you i have to listen to this in its entirety with you <laughs> oh and that one was was awkward because there was a lot more cursing on it the subject matter was a lot darker too it was a, it was a lot of stuff about crime and whatever and then <laughs> like like halfway through the second half of the album, there's a song called Girls Let's Get Butt Naked and Fuck. I was just about to ask if that was on the <laughs> record. That's the first thing that went through my mind. It's like, how'd you get through that one? Yeah, which is so funny. By today's standards, it's so tame. Yeah, slapstick almost. Yeah, but they just keep saying the line, Girls Let's Get Butt Naked and Fuck. Like that's repeated at every course. And um, that was awkward. <laughs> but but my mom let me keep it my mom let me keep the record she was like because she was like i like him because he talks about crime but then he teaches a lesson at the end of the song that's true and which, he was he was a storyteller too he had a lot of yeah. storytelling problems. <laughs> which he always did he always flipped it and kind of told you about the bad part at the end and when he spoke at my college he emphasized that he was like that was always my style man like i always like wanted to flip it to teach you like the lesson. And then he was like, I remember he was like, I'm working on a new track called the B side of ballin where it's about the, the dark half or whatever. And, um, and my mom in that moment also became a lifelong iced tea, not, not fan in the sense that she listens to his music, but like supporter, like she likes iced tea. Like she likes SVU and like, <laughs> she likes him as an actor. <laughs> That's what's so crazy that he is kind of America's sweetheart now when you think that they were wild you know, cop killer and all that when he went through that. And now he somehow scrubbed his image and just banking on yeah. court TV. My dad wouldn't. That, I remember that was a rec I wasn't allowed to have that record. My dad wouldn't buy me the Body Count album because on the front cover, there was the, the, the painting of the guy and it said cop killer on his chest. It was tattooed on. And my dad was like, I, I just would rather not get this for you. And like, so I had to go get that one on my own. But I remember that was one that like, I wasn't allowed to have because it was like, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, talk about a protest record. That first body count record is fucking brilliant because, you know, people classify it as as a metal record. But but to me, it's it's much it's much more in the vein it's got metal elements, obviously, but to me, it's much more in the vein of the misfits. Oh, yeah. And I was like, man, they took them, they the, like the sort of sound of the misfits and then evolved it into a more metal sound and then turned it into protest music, which is fucking wild, man. Like that, like people don't, people take it for granted. Now this is like, sorry, I'm going to, I'm getting off on a thing here, mm -hmm. but like, I got so mad when when everybody was criticizing Ice Cube for meeting with Donald Trump because I was like, all of you little kids out there who walk around with T-shirts on that say, fuck the police, he's the one that made it possible for you. Do you understand this man is light years beyond what you understand right now? And maybe he's just trying to continue this journey in the best way he can with meeting with a president that people don't like but maybe that's a step in the evolution to get where he needs to go for the cause or whatever and like it just drove me crazy because so few people know the history people take iced tea for granted and it's like there wasn't there wasn't a lot of black protest music out there outside of hip-hop at the time of of body count yep. you know you know, there weren't a lot of black bands that sounded like that. You had bad brains, you know. They were so and, they were so far in the you know, they came so far before Body Count, you know. And I always thought yeah. of Body Count as a punk band more than a metal band anyway. Yeah, yeah. To me it was Bad Brains, Living Color, and Body Count until until a band named or called Death came out. Yeah, that nobody knew about um, watch that documentary to find out yeah, about it. Yeah, exactly. Like it was like 
you know, man, that, that was not like a common thing. Like, and people just kind of are like, Oh yeah, I see he's got a heavy <laughs> metal corpus. Well, Johnny Rotten took <laughs> Johnny Rotten took heat too for talking up Trump too, like the original punk frontman, and all these old punks were getting just furious with him. I'm like, don't you do you not expect anything different from this guy? He's never changed his attitude towards anything, and he it just drove yeah. people crazy. I'm sure he just loved it. Yeah, I I always wonder what Johnny Rotten like. Did he? I feel like he's just so fucking blah that like he's like i'm just gonna say because he he was a big trump denouncer and then he switched on a dime and i was like i think he's doing this just to annoy everybody right okay. now yeah, like <laughs> but but you know man like um you know rap music is you know chuck d uh called it the black cnn and and he was right and it's like it's like it's it's people just don't get like like how important the music was it's so uh, it kills me man it just anyway it doesn't anyway so well, you, yeah you're probably I don't mean to rant and rave like, here but when you first listen right. to public enemy it took a second for like they're rapping about the fbi tapping their telephones and stuff like that and it just didn't really make sense to me early on. like the first time i heard i'm like what and i thought public enemy sounded like the first rap punk band because they weren't going for choruses or anything it was just yeah. messages and just a nice beat and the, you know pounding away it's crazy. I remember when we got into Black Sla Sabbath and Slayer in college, because me and my friends were almost strictly hip hop all through high school. Um, I I started to I started to diversify when in my twelfth my senior year when I got into Bad Religion, and that was another game changer for me. Um, but but I started to kind of listen to some more punk, and then my buddy Brian Chevry he started to get more into metal. So he was the one that was kind of showing me um, Sabbath and Slayer and then like pointing out the samples. Oh, yeah. So like playing Rain and Blood to, for me and being like, dude, do you recognize that? That she watched Channel Zero by Public Enemy. And I was like, holy shit. And then like hearing like all the Sabbath tunes that Ice-T sampled, realizing as I got into punk music that on his Freedom of Speech record, this guy, Joe Biafra, that did the whole opening was Dick the Kennedy. singer that did Kennedy's like and seeing like all of this crossover that I had never, ever realized. And it just blew my my mind. And now all of a sudden you can say like fuck. you can say fuck, by the way, I've said I've said it like four times. Oh. I'm just trying to make myself not look <laughs> limited, but uh, it's like the floor falls out from under you. And then you see that there are all these la levels that go deeper and deeper and deeper yeah. that I never even knew were there, you know, and it was just wild. It was just like so crazy discovering all that stuff, you know, for sure. And the thing about hip hop is it was like early punk that everything that came out early sounded distinctive because there was no model. Everybody was just trying to come up with stuff that there was, there were literally no rules because nobody knew there was so, so little of it. That, you know, all the way up through Public Enemy and that kind of stuff, every record from every band or group seemed to sound different, you know? Yeah, well, it's interesting, too, because, you know, I, I, I was I was saying to I met a guy recent. I live in New York. I met a guy recently here. Who um, I'm blanking on his name, but he's a he's a, he was a producer and all this stuff, so he knows like. He grew up in that whole Lower East Side thing. Um, he knows like Fab Five Freddy and, and you know, he, he hung around the Andy Warhol parties, all this crazy historical shit from New York that you only see now in documentaries. But he was telling me, I was telling him, I said, you know, that whole cross section of music that was happening at that time in, in New York City was, was very foreign to me. I was a suburban kid that liked rap music those worlds didn't cross in the suburbs in the suburbs the kids that were into skateboarding you know they were thrasher t-shirts and they listened to um you know metal church and 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 you know uh metallica and and, and all that stuff the kids that like rap me rap music you know we listened to rap music we didn't skateboard or anything like that you know um then there were hippie kids and, and those, those were the kids that were kind of into reggae and, and country and shit like that. 
and 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 then there were straight up metalheads. But none of there was no cross section for any of it in the suburbs. It was all very separated. You could be friends, but very rarely were you because you just didn't have the same interests um, and activities and stuff like that. And at least where I grew up. And I was like, it wasn't until the Beastie Boys that I realized that there was this weird cross pollination of music happening in New York City. And then I told him about discovering the samples and all that stuff that I just told you guys. And and, uh, you know, you but you see it on both sides. You saw it in, in hip hop with what they were sampling, but then you saw it on the punk side. You saw like you saw punk bands, you saw Bad Brains also do reggae. You saw Didi Ramon eventually <laughs> put out a hip hop record. You know, yeah, I remember that one. You saw like these bands, like, you know what I mean? You saw rappers sampling the punk stuff or whatever. It, what about there was, Bl Blondie's the perfect example? Blondie, yeah. Blondie was, Blondie was, I was, I, I just opened a bar in like social club in New York and it's on the Lower East Side. It's two blocks away from where they actually shot the Paul's Boutique album cover which oh, wow. i didn't know but when we were designing it and the the artists were saying what's the inspiration we were, we were saying we want to we want to cross over all the greatest decades of of this neighborhood and i kept using the beastie boys and blondie as the example i was like i was like it's got to be cbgb's but it's also got to be studio 54 but it's also got to be punk but it's also got to be hip-hop <laughs> you know, like, and those were the two groups where I was like, I think they bring, I think you, and every time I said Paul's boutique, they would go, Oh, okay. Okay. I, I understand now. Right. You know, I get what you mean. So, um, so it's, it's just an interesting, interesting, um, his, his historical, you know, point of, uh, period of music, you know, anyway. Yeah, well, they so, were, like, Andy was punk <laughs> before they were, they were, yeah. Definitely. Super punk. They're, or not, I mean, not hardcore, but they came out of the, they came out of the same scene as Ramones and all those guys. Yeah. Television. Yeah. They were like, CB, but so hard of glass, you know, one of the biggest yeah. Blondie song. That was a reggae song at first. And when they got signed, the producer or whoever was like, you've got to, if you want to sell any records, you better change this. And then they made it like a disco song <laughs> and it works. It works both ways, you know, like, <laughs> But that's, yeah, like they were much more like sort of, yeah, like reggae-ish. Like, yeah, you got to go back and listen to the stuff. old stuff. Segwaying into comedy, weren't you, weren't, wasn't your first foray into comedy musical? Didn't you have like a, a musical duo or something? Did I read that? Well, so, yes, yes. It, but that's, okay, so the first foray into comedy was I was playing in a band and me and my buddy went and to do an open mic because we just wanted to play. Wait, you were you you started a band? We have to talk about the band. I played music before I ever did comedy. I thought I was going to play. I thought that's what I was going to do. I thought what I was going to be a musician. What kind of music? Well, I got it like because I was so into hip hop. I started rapping when I was in about sixth grade. Yeah. I got my first turntable when I was in eighth grade. Um, I started making my own beats when I got into college because I was able to afford some like low level equipment. So proud. I, I wanted to do hip hop through all college. My first band band that I was ever in was, was basically a, a, a bad cover band. But then the first original band I was ever in was called fancy lads. And that was, that was a hardcore band. And, um, what'd you play where, what, Did Oh, you what? Oh, I sang in that okay. band. Gotcha. But I also played drums. Okay. Not in that band. I just played drums. You still so, play drums? We're always looking for drummers. <laughs> do you still play? I, I do. I haven't played in a while, but I'd love to come down and just play. <laughs> I really would. I You're miss in. playing drums a lot. I um, think probably make that happen. Yeah. You can you should where are you guys? Drums. We're in Nashville. I mean, I need to make a trip to Nashville. One of my best friends lives in Nashville. Um, Steve Byrne, who's a great comic. Yeah. We've talked to him yeah. here in person. Yeah, Steve's one of my best friends. I've been meaning to come down and visit him. My friend Steve lives down there. I need to make a trip to that. I was actually thinking of maybe buying a house down there, but we should. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and uh we'll send you one of our new singles and maybe you can just drum on it. 
You could just. I will do that in two seconds. Okay. You have cool. my word. I'm dead serious. Okay. We'll make it happen. Would, we got drums here. We got it all. I would love that. I would love that. That'd be so fun. Just we to, record everything in JB's studio and behind his house, so it's just super low key and cool and chill and fun. We're definitely going to do it happen next time you're in town. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, awesome. hardcore band, right? And were you writing songs for that band? <clears throat> a little bit. I was. Well. It was like a four person collaboration on the writing. Usually the guitar player would come in with the parts and go, this is the song. This is how it goes, like from front to back. And then we would make up our own individual parts that went with it. Sometimes I didn't really write much because I didn't know how to play guitar at all at that time. Um, but then I stopped doing that and I started drumming full time in an indie rock pop sort of band called Bernie Bernie head flap. I know it's a weird name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and those guys were amazing. They were great musicians. And that was the first band I was ever in that had a record deal. And it was a small record label out of Pennsylvania called Creep Records. Um, and they're sort of still around. They are still around, but they're not really doing what they used to do. But they used to put out a lot of punk records. So they actually did a record with Bouncing Souls. Like that was probably the biggest thing they'd ever done. But um, so it was the first time I was ever like, there were like stakes when I was playing shows. Um, not big shows, but we were playing shows and there were, there were like actual fans that liked us. And we were playing with bands that were much, much more challenging than anybody I would ever played with. It was a very intimidating but exciting thing to do. So I was with that for a while. And then me and the guitar player, Paul Chell, really hit it off. And we started a band together called Salsa Windfall. That, that's basically <laughs> like early ween, you know, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. We're still doing stuff. We just started again, recording again. And we have an album we're about to put out. We still oh. do stuff together. So I still do music. Um, so me and Paul are still at it. But that's been going on for a long time. But, but then I got out of that scene in college and I, and I started getting, getting back into hip hop and, and I had a group, I had a group with my friend Pat and, and I really thought that's what I was going to do. Um, I maxed out all my credit. I graduated college. I maxed out all my credit cards on equipment, started making beats like full time, um, started really, really getting into it. And it just didn't work out. And then, and then around that time, another band that was also on Creep Records called the Cougars um, called me and said, we need a drummer. Will you drum for us? And I said, no. And they said, why? And I said, I'm done drumming. I just want to work on hip hop. And I'm also kind of doing stand up comedy now. And I need to focus on those two things. I can't focus on another thing. And they begged me. They were like, please, dude, like, we just think you'd really fit in with us and whatever. And I was like, against my better judgment, I was like, okay, fine. So they sent me their CD. This has significance. Uh, they sent me their CD. <laughs> I learned the whole thing in like a week because I had time on my hands at that time. And, um, I went in for the, like, let's see if this gels. And I knew all the songs already. And they were like, wow, we're so impressed. Like, you know, it's like, yeah. And they're like, dude, just, we want you like, you're in, you're our new drummer. We have one more show with our old drummer and then it's all you. And I was like, great. And they're like, dude, Creep Records is excited about us. We're about to go on a huge tour. This is like, this is it, dude. Like, like, this is it. Like, we're going to be a real <laughs> band that makes money. And I was like, Okay, I'm in, dude. Fuck stand-up comedy. Let's do it. And um, I went to the show to support them, their last show with the old drummer. And the old drummer was in the bathroom peeing next to my friend Dan, who I was in Fancy Lads with. And Dan was like, man, you're a great drummer. And like, what a cool band. It's a shame you're leaving. And the drummer goes, what? Oh, no. Yeah. And he goes, it's a shame. You know, my buddy Joe's here. He's taking over your son. He goes, no, dude, I decided not to leave. And they completely fucked me. They never told me to this day. They never told me to my face. 
And that's when I was like, fuck this, fuck music, fuck working with other people. Here it is. I am going to be a full-time stand-up comic. And that's what I did. And within a year, I was moving up to New York to do comedy full-time. And, and that was it. And I never really looked back. Um, but to answer your question, the first time I ever did comedy or tried it, was because I was in this band with my buddy and we wanted to just go fuck around in an open mic. And we went in and they put us on last. So we sat there drinking all night and so did the audience. And when we got on stage, they weren't listening to us because they were drunk. And because we were drunk, we started riffing all these songs about how much they sucked. And they started listening to us and laughing. And when we got off stage, the manager of the bar said, I think your act is really funny. I want you to do a comedy show here. That's how I started doing comedy. <laughs> <laughs> nice. By accident. <laughs> and then after I was in comedy for a year or two, me and my buddy Jim had, we tried to do a Tenacious D thing where we had a sex rap group called Deep. <laughs> <laughs> that was really explicit. And we, we put out a record and we were about to put out a second record. And I go, dude, we can't put this out. <laughs> I can't have this like trailing me. Like, 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 I know we know it's a joke, but somebody's going to hear this and not know it's a joke. And I don't think we should do this anymore. And he's like, I agree. Cause he was actually trying to make it as a record producer in a back when record studios existed. Way back. Uh, <laughs> you know, so we both just thought it was a good idea to put it down. So we put that down and that's probably the duo you're talking about. Yeah. Because some uh, people still bring it up to me, you know, do you still have the second record somewhere like on? Yeah, I have it. I have it. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. But it's. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think society's come far enough now that they could probably accept the material you were doing back then. You know, you're are, not you <laughs> are you nuts? Are you nuts? I was fucking sweating bullets all last year that this goddamn thing was going to come out. I was going to get canceled. <laughs> it's fucking terrified, man. The, uh, yeah, there's, there's, but anyway, um, that was, uh, yeah, no, this, uh, so, so, th so that's it. I do stand up now. I write, you know, and but, okay, all so the, the guy you know. asked you to do a comedy show there. Yeah. So you just start, there's this like a weekly thing you're going in to do and you guys yeah. start, uh, you know, just making jokes about the audience. Basically. And were you, you, you had done some comedy. So were you aware of a lot of the hatred of other comics with guitar acts or musical acts in a comedy scenario? Well, at that point I hadn't done any stand up yet. That was literally where it all started. So, so, um, no, Raylene, we would we would not um we would not do we would not make fun of the audience. We we went in with um you know sketches for lack of a better term. We'd write things. We were really into three things at the time. Excuse me, we were really into three things at the time. We were really into Mr. Show with Bob Bob and Bob Odenkirk and David Cross. We were really into Andy Kaufman and we were really into Jackass. So, you know, we just tried to, to go in with stuff with that sensibility of being sort of very, very edgy and very daring. And because of the jackass and Andy Coffin stuff, a lot of it was sort of, I guess, at its core, like sort of prankish, but not pranks on the audience or anything, just like comedy. Like, like the one thing I remember we did was I wrote a very dramatic dinner scene where a mother is telling her son that she's leaving their father because she's actually, she's realized she's a lesbian and she's in love with another woman. And the scene was very serious, but then the joke was that we, we ate, we made all the six course meal and we made it all the most like disgusting food we could think of. And we told the audience beforehand, like, these are the courses we'll be eating. And the whole thing was to not throw up, like, while we were doing the dramatic scene. It was shit like that. You know what I mean? Like, there wasn't much to it. But, like, it was kind of funny, I guess. But, like, but then he bailed. He's like, you know, man, I have a really good job, like, teaching math. And I like teaching. And I don't give a fuck about doing 
puke sketches for six people in a bar uh, on a Monday night because we would do it during halftime of Monday night football. Oh, wow. <clears throat> and um, I was very much because of my band history the show must go on, you know, like that was it. You know, when I was in a band with the same guy, he used to call me El Presidente. Cause I, cause I was very much like, it has to be like this, you know, like I was very like, <laughs> 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 so, you know, but every group needs of somebody like that. You need that. It's like, yeah. I, I, I see the same thing with radio, like what, again, morning radio, a thing that doesn't really exist anymore, but when it was a thing, you needed a guy like that on the crew. Like you needed a guy that like steered the ship. If you don't have, or, or a person like that, I don't mean to genderize it, but you know what I mean? But like you, you need a person like that without that. It's a fucking, it's a, it's a mess. Yeah. So, yeah. um, so in my angsty youth, I was much too harsh about it, but, but you know, but whatever. Um, so anyway, he didn't want to do it anymore. And then so then I had to go in for the first time and do the comedy show by myself. So I was like, well, I've always wanted to try stand up. I guess this is my chance. And I wrote a bunch of stand up that night, the night before and went in. And for the first time ever, the place was packed, it was packed. <laughs> and I did stand up for the first time. Do you remember which and game I was on? No idea. It wasn't packed for the game, though. It was packed because it was two. They had two birthday parties in there. Ah. Um, and that was it. That's how I started stand up. And I remember I came off stage. And a kid that I grew up with named Andy. Who was the first kid I ever knew to say, I don't believe in God when we were 12 years old, which was a wild thing at 12. When you were going to Catholic school. Uh, he came up to me and he said, I'm really offended by a lot of what you said. And I said, what in particular? And he mentioned the thing I said about the church. And I said, what the fuck are you talking about? You're an atheist. And he goes, oh, well, dude, like I'm like super religious now. And I remember being like, like thinking like, OK, so when we were kids and you wanted to say God doesn't exist, you were a dick about that. And now that you're super religious, you're going to be a dick about that. <laughs> Fuck you. Fuck you, Andy. And that got me off more than anything. That really, like, really got me going was that somebody was a thing. Like, I really liked that. And like, that's what I carried with me to the next week to want to do it again. More than the laughs, you know, the, eventually I realized the importance of the laughter. <laughs> but that it, initially again, from a music background of, and like being like really into rebellious music, that was what really excited me. And funny enough, once I, once I got, a, you know, established that same guy reached out to me and asked me if he, I could help him shop a script. <laughs> of course. Aww. And I said, no, no, I can't. <laughs> Do you have any comedians when you were a kid that you looked up to that were edgy like that? Or is this just something that came, you know, did you, were you a huge comedy fan or is it just like, eh, maybe I'll give it a shot? No, George Carlin was, a. I, I, I first saw George Carlin when I was 11 or 12 years old on HBO. And that was life changing for me. Uh, to this day, he's my idol above everybody um, artistically. And um, that was life changing for me to see a guy who was older than my parents criticizing things that my parents thought wild i'd never seen anything like that you don't see that you go to catholic school every single adult thinks one thing um and and that's how it works and 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 then you and then all your friends parents their kids go to the catholic school so they all think the same thing so to to see this this what what at the time to me looked like an old man with gray hair you know, being on stage going, religion is nothing but mind control. And, you know, it's like, holy shit. <laughs> that, uh, that blew me away. Um, so that was, the, it was him always, first and foremost. So you're in Pennsylvania and you said you went to New York basically a, a year in of doing comedy. Is that what you said earlier? 
Wait, say that one more time. So you you're in Pennsylvania. Was that where you were doing the first comedy bit? Like your first stand up the bar you're talking about? Um, yeah, it was a bar in my hometown. I grew up in a town called Collegeville, Pennsylvania, and that's where the and how long was. and then you moved to New York from there. How long did it take you from that first gig to going, fuck it, I'm moving to New York? Um about a year. Wow. Maybe maybe a year and a half, something like that. Yeah. Pretty bold move. What was it like landing in New York then? I mean, you know, you didn't have a ton well, I, of page time underneath your belt when you just made the jump. I had assistants, Jay Okerston, who's a great comic. He he mm -hmm. sort of plucked me out of Philly and said, Come to New York. I think you're ready to start making your way up here. That was huge. To Ray Gordon, who's a great comic. He mentored me while I was in Philly. I always credit him as my mentor. Like he's the guy that got me started, got me my first paid work. Uh, the Laugh House in Philly, which is no longer there, was the club I started at. They always, you know, they 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 worked me pretty regularly from pretty early on. The legendary Wid, who was a comic there, was very supportive. He hosted the open mic that I started at. Um, you know, you have these people that kind of help you you know, shuffle through and it's still scary. I mean, it still takes a certain amount of strategy and, and, and risk and all this stuff, but those people are instrumental. I, I feel like, you know, look, if you don't have that, it's, I'm not saying you don't have a shot, but it's, it's a lot easier if you have that. It's like, if you're an artistic kid and your parents don't nurture that, it's a lot harder, you know? So, um, I, my parents, too. I was very lucky. Um, my parents always were very, outside of the financial worry, they were very supportive of me artistically. That's cool. Which is huge. That helps. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that helps. Um, so, you know, they, they, we were a very paycheck to paycheck family growing up. They were not able to float me while I figured these things out. And they were also strict with me about it. They were like, you don't get to just live here for free and figure it all out. Like right. get your ass out of the house, go find a place to live, get a job. They were strict about all that, but they were, they were also very supportive of my art and, and me flourishing in that and stuff. So that helps. That helps a lot. Yeah. And that's cool. It seems to be a theme of people we talk to, everybody from like Dane Cook, Nick DiPaolo, they speak about how somebody that was in New York already that was from their hometown would bring them along and sort of introduce them to everybody. And there's like those classes of comics that come through and seems like, you know, I'm sure there was some backstabbing or whatever, but it seems like the, the, the really good ones were helpful with the people that they thought were good. It's kind of like playing in a band. If a, a band that's more popular than you thinks you're good, they grab you and take you out on the road. You get to open for them. So it sounds like the same yeah. thing comedy. It, it, it is in many ways. Once I got on my feet, then people, you know, then I got the chance to get in that way, supported by people, you know, Jordan Rubin, who is a writer, who's a comic, but he, he writes a lot more than he does stand up now, um, you know, wrote, wrote for the Oscars and all kinds of stuff. He got me my first TV break. You know, he was writing for Carson Daly's talk show at the time. He brought me on. Carson really liked me. Carson had me on a couple of times, which was really nice. Um, and then, you know, like I said, Jay kept supporting me. Um, Bill Burr was a real early supporter, took me out on the road with him and stuff. Patton Oswalt, Jeff Garland, Dave Chappelle. Uh, I was lucky. I had a lot of really great comedians that I looked up to for whatever fucking reason, take a liking to me and support me, you know, Rich Voss, Nick DiPaolo, Keith Robinson, Patrice O'Neill. You know, they, they, they just, they, they really backed me up and, and took care of me. Uh, and then all of that led to me getting onto the Opie and Anthony show. And that was really where I started to finally get some real footing and ground underneath me. Those were hilarious. I missed that show badly. So do I, <laughs> so do I. And it makes me sad because it's all just the whole crew is, it's not a crew anymore. You know, it's kind of yeah. like. You know, it's funny. We're talking about bands and, you know, and there are bands that I look at like that where you go, that's so sad. Like, you know, the original guys are all scattered, but it's like, 
I mean, I'm not talking out of school. If you listen to everybody's individual show, you see that a lot, a, not everybody, some of the people still talk and are still tight, you know. Uh, I saw Nick the other night, had a great conversation. I'm still really tight with Voss. You know, I'm still, I, you know, I talk to Bobby all the time. It's like, it's, it's like, but, but it's scattered out now, man. It's like, starting with the fact that Opie and Anthony don't yeah, say Yeah, there's that. <laughs> so, you know, like. But that whole era you know, of New York very comic, sad. that whole tough crowd era and that particular group of comics that got on that show, that was, that was some of my favorite stuff growing up watching them. And you could tell that, you know, I don't know, it's just the way they used to bust balls and the way it was mm -hmm. like completely honest. And some of the stuff that I, I go back and watch clips on of uh, YouTube and some of the stuff they got away with. It wasn't that long ago, the things that they were allowed to say on that show. And it was wild, man. Yeah, it's, it was a different time. It was well, a sure. different time. Uh, I mean, and you know, I'm always torn with that stuff because it's kind of like, I, I, I'm, I'm all for progress, you know, and I'm all for us. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't really believe in, 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 I believe in, I believe in evolution scientifically. I mean, you know, and I believe in the evolution of human beings in a physical sense. Um, and you know, in a scientific sense. Um, but in a sense of human nature, I don't really believe in evolution. Uh, I think at the core, you know, George Carlin talked about it a lot. The lizard brain is, you know, still very much at work or whatever. And I agree with that. So I'm all for the, 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 you know, the, this concept of social progress where, you know, maybe we don't say certain things anymore because it's, it's no longer appropriate or, 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 or it's more hurtful than we thought it was or whatever, but I'm not, I'm not for this thing of under any circumstance not having the right to say something. I, I understand the concept, obviously, that if I go on some crazy tirade on a podcast and I say a bunch of fucked up stuff about women or, or racial or whatever, and then I lose, don't I, <laughs> and I lose an opportunity because of that, I understand that. I understand that a person has a right to say, I don't want to employ you. I'm sorry. Like, I don't agree with your views. They upset me. I get that. I get that. But I also think that that concept, the, the, the boundaries of that concept have, have, have spanned so greatly at this point, you know, and hopefully it gets a little under control again, but you know, I, I'm not a big fan of this abbreviation thing happening, you know, and then they said C word, F word. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> painfully fucking childish to me. Then we've talked about this. The, you have a the, great uh, joke the, about the, this. The, those blank words, like they, they change because the C word has changed. It used to be con now you can't the Shane Gillis word, you know, you can't say right. that the new C word. Right. That word yeah. used to be fuck, but now it's the uh, homosexual connotation. You can't say that. So it's changed. The N word is, well, it's, it's that's the granddaddy of them all. The, the, right, right, yeah. right. And it's, it's, uh, it's just odd to me that like, it's <laughs> odd to me that no matter what, that, that, that this, I guess that the concept of context is being lost. And so that's odd to me. But also, too, what's more interesting to me about that whole thing is that, and this is why I bring up the evolution thing. If you look at the way people react to the people that say they're doing good on behalf of this, the ones that claim to be evolved, that's what I mean when I say I don't really believe in the, the, the evolution when it comes to human nature. They don't act like evolved human beings. It's a very they act point. like savages. They act like barbarians. It's, 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 it's about ostracizing. You know, it's about banishment. It's not about a teachable moment. It's not about a learnable moment. I mean, talk about a failure. When Roseanne made that joke that got her fired, Talk about a missed opportunity for everybody to take a breath and learn 
for to give to 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 give somebody a chance to come out and say, "Hey, I fucked up. I made a joke I shouldn't have made, and here's why I made it, and here's why or why not that's okay." And because you know, Roseanne said she thought the woman was white, and there's all kinds of, and she was on Ambien. Who knows? My point is, is what a teachable moment that was just completely wasted and lost, and we got nothing out of it whatsoever. When Roseanne, uh, you know, heavy quotes here, disgraced the national anthem <laughs> at that baseball game. And by the way, that was very controversial at the time. Yeah, I remember I that was back when Americana was real close to people's hearts. Yeah. And it was people wanted her fucking canceled then for that. That, that was an outrage. That was that was scandalous when that happened. And. She came out on the first episode of the next season and made the joke of I just want to sing <laughs> <laughs> now, granted. They made a joke about it and they kept it moving. But I was like, I'm watching this show that's about this middle American family that deals with that has always dealt with all of these issues, racism, Islamophobia, uh, welfare, uh, uh, um, you know, um, uh, sexual assault, just just issue after issue after issue, sexual harassment that they've always tackled on the show. And I'm like, this is the, this is God or the universe or whoever is screaming down to you right now that this is a teachable moment. Take your show, bring her back in the next season and address this, but address it through the character. And it would be fucking fascinating. And we could all grow as people. And instead it's just like, no, banish her back to her fucking nut ranch and, <laughs> Hawaii and let's never hear from her again. Burn the whole yeah. show down and everybody goes home. Yeah. And and now make a substandard show, which I hate to say because I have friends that are on the show. I'm not trying to trash the show. It's called Roseanne. I mean, <laughs> well, it's called the Connors. Now. Connor, so. oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I must have watched the new one. Yeah. But I have friends on it. I'm not trashing it. You know, when I got fired the fir- from the sitcom I was on, uh, Sarah, Sarah Gilbert was the first uh, person to call me and, and, be really she's very sweet i like her a lot my friend jay ferguson's on the show i'm not trashing the show but i just feel like what a fucking waste but i mean that's that's also like that's the part of it that bothers me we're not learning from any of these mistakes and we're erasing history while we're at it i don't think it's just out of fear though right i think everybody's just scared sure because they don't want to be canceled either it's got to drive a guy like you crazy when you see other comedians attacking comedians, not to saying they're not funny or not breaking their balls, but telling them that they're allowed, not allowed to make jokes about certain subject matters. It's got to drive you crazy. I want to go on record that I've thought from almost the beginning of my career, that comedians are worthless scum that only <laughs> think about themselves and where their next paycheck is coming from. Uh, so I've always said that. So I, I, as much as that disgusts me, I'm not that surprised. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're talking about a group of people that think they should be allowed to be on stage with everybody listening to them and applauding them. You're not dealing with mentally stable human beings here. Uh, and I can speak from my own experience and, and for myself there, but uh, comedian finding a good, decent comic human being in a human being sense. That's, you know, go ahead. That's like finding a, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't even want to compare another group of professionals nope, because I don't not. want to offend anybody. Yeah. But <laughs> my point is, is, uh, you know, the comics are, uh, the, 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 the good guys are few and far between. Yeah. I can see that. Would you rather have, uh, be on stage playing a song you wrote and everyone in the audience singing it with you screaming it? Cause it's just the hit song or, be on stage telling your jokes and everybody laughing and what's well, be- tell me what's better. I don't I don't know because I never experienced the music version of it I've played song you know I've played sh- music shows but I never did a show where everybody knew the song and it was you know what I mean like right, right. Um, so I don't know what that feels like 
Maybe a plot um, after and just being really into it. You know, everybody's into it kind of thing. Any, any of those shows? <laughs> Did you have any I've never of played any of those shows no. either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, comedy is a weird drug because it's just, it's very different. Like I, I made a short film with, with Bill Byrne and Robert Kelly a lot of years ago. And I remember sitting and it went to the Tribeca Film Festival, which was really cool. But like, I remember sitting in a packed theater and watching the audience react to that it was amazing. And it was a very, very different fulfillment than stand up is. So saying, would I take one or the other? It's, it's really hard to say. Um, it really, for me, a lot of the time depends on the mood you're in. I have plenty of nights where I think stand up's the greatest thing in the world. And why would you want to do anything else? And I have plenty of nights where I'm like, I don't feel like doing this right now, but you figure out a way to turn it on and, and go do it. So I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you've all, also always done a lot of writing, but be it for shorts, like you say on the internet, you did a, a, a mini series with uh, Ray Lynn's favorite comic. Oh, Nikki Glazer, point. Yeah. Yeah. The breakup. Oh, yeah. 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 So you. What's that? The, the, what was the, what was oh, the, yeah, the breakup? It, no, no, it broke up first. I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Oh, no. We're just talking about this. The thing you did with Nikki, uh, the breakup series or whatever. I can't remember what it was called, but we yeah. should break up. We should break up. I was yeah. going to say it's break up something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, you, you, you managed to, like, how did you get into. Is that something you always wanted to do when you were doing stand up? Like maybe I'll do some writing too, because you've done a ton of writing and you've been in you've I'm been kind in movies. Acting, yeah, now. you've done a ton of acting too. So how do you get how do you uh maneuver your way into those paths from just stand up, just meeting people that have gigs? How's that work? No, it was always a real uphill battle, which is why I stopped doing it. Um I uh no with writing it was something I was interested in from, from an early age. Uh, and when I got into stand up, I started to realize I might, I might actually have a chance to try it or do it. So when Bobby and Billy and I started talking about doing a short film and I mean, this was before Billy really blew up and before Bobby got, got established to the place he is now. And, and I certainly was a long ways away from where I'm at and like, we did that because we, we got tired of hearing no. I and mean, we got tired of people telling us no, pitching shows and people saying no, thank you. So we said, let's just do our own thing. So we did. And I, I asked them, I said, can I, can I write the screenplay? Like, we'll all write the story together, but can I write the screenplay? Can I sit down and be the, because I want the opportunity to, and can I direct it? And they said, yeah. So we did more collaboration on the screenplay than initially intended. But I got to direct it. And that's kind of how all that started for me. And then taking that, one of the producers on that, Lou Wallach, he got a gig um, at when YouTube first, this was like YouTube at one time didn't have channels. Right. YouTube was just random videos. And then YouTube said, we're going to make channels. And they, they did 10 channels. They gave one to Warner Brothers. They gave one to this sort of comedy, filmmaking, whatever company. They gave one to Sarah Silverman. They were like 10. I lucked out. One of the producers on the movie we did was a develop, became a development guy at the comedy channel. And a guy that directed a short film that our short film screened with, who I became friends with, worked at Warner Brothers. So I got these two deals kind of no questions asked at both channels because I knew the guys and they knew what I was able to do. So that's how that happened. But there were people above them that were constantly punching down on us and constantly you couldn't get any support. And that stuff was fleeting. And it was a lot of work for not a lot of money. And after that, I started to go into the writer's rooms in LA and, and write for TV shows. And I, 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 I had some great times and I'm glad I did it, but I, I at, at its core, I really hated that process. It's very hard to go from a comedian who could say and do whatever they want and, and do these gigs with these web things where 
you're the director, producer, writer, and sometimes actor, um, to, to, to then sitting in a room with six or 10 other people, mm. having to collaborate, having a head writer there that acts as your first filtration. Then you've got whoever show it is that has to sign off and everything. But then you've got the producers that are going to put their notes in. Then the network is coming in and saying, we can't do this. And, and then there's sponsors. And I, I, it just wasn't for me. But I did it for two, three years. And that was a struggle. It wasn't like these gigs were just, you just get them. It was laborious to, to get these gigs. And you got them and they, they lasted a finite period of time and you never knew if you were going to get rehired and you didn't really want to get rehired. But then if you didn't, you felt terrible about yourself and <laughs> it just wasn't fun or enjoyable. And that's kind of when I said to myself, hey, you know, man, if you really wanted to be writing and directing things, you would be doing it the way you do stand up. You know? You're willing to drive across town to do a seven minute spot for zero money. You're right. willing to fly across the country for, for what turns out not to be a lot of cash after you pay your agent and your manager and your lawyer and whatever else uh, you're willing to do that. You're not being proactive with this other stuff. And that's when I said, okay, I'm going to keep doing stand up, but I'm going to focus on it more. And I'm going to take this skill set of things that I learned in these writers' rooms and, and these other gigs and put that, apply that to something that I'm able to do on my own. And that's when my, I kept writing, but my writing shifted. I started to write screenplays um, because I had full control over that. And then it was like, hey, if, if, I, if I get it made, I hand it off and then it's their problem. I yeah. don't care. And you're um, basically just describing uh, like with your first short film with Bill and Bob, it's, it's, yeah. you, it's like a punk band. You started because nobody will record your stuff or let you do what you want to do. So screw it. We'll make our own record, maybe form our own label. Yada, That's yada, it. Yada. Yeah. And you get signed and then I, yeah. I started fiction writing, doing horror fiction, short, short fiction. Um, got lucky enough to get published in certain places, but then also start to like, I just did a record with, a special thing records. We just recorded it. It's, I don't know when it'll be out, but I did a, I wrote an op-ed column for penthouse for about two years. And um, we recorded all of my entries into the column. I did a monthly entry for two years. So we did audio recordings of them in a studio with no audience. And I was like, as we were doing it, I was like, Oh, I could, I could just do records like this. I've got 10 short stories that I've had published like in, in horror stories that were that Fangoria and Penthouse and some other things published. I could do a record of the, of me reading those short stories. I could write a whole record like this and just do it. Like that's the kind of writing now that I like and, and enjoy. And then again, like I do like the screenplay thing because it's still entertainment and it's still a little connected to Hollywood um, but again, you write it, you, you, you know, I have a thing that we're, you know, it takes forever, but I've handed it off. It's like, I wrote it and now the producers and the directors are attached and we're trying to find talent and I don't have to think about it. Right. It's like, it's over there, but in a writer's room, it never fucking ends. You take that home with you. And then you're there again the next day. And I, I don't know about anybody else that's done it, but like I, I was too exhausted to do anything else. You it's get home and cook dinner and you're like, I'm done. I'm, I'm ready to go to bed. This is like a job job. I don't want to do this. Yeah. You know, like so. Speaking of records, do comics make records anymore? I know you when you were coming up. Uh, yeah. You put out records, but do they just put specials out on video now or do they? while they're making records and pressing them up and put them out. Uh, no, you, I mean, you can still do vine. I mean, vinyls, nobody really yeah. does a CD anymore. Sometimes people want vinyl to collect. Right. So vinyl still makes some sense. Most of the albums are digital. I think specials are going to kind of go the way of the Dodo because of YouTube, which 
that's fine. You know, I, I, I like YouTube. I like that the power is in our hands now. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I like that you can monetize your own stuff through Patreon and all these other services. I think that's fucking great. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm fully in support of that stuff. But, Do you uh, think the hour special may be in jeopardy? Yes. It seems like the attention spans are down to five minutes or so. I think it's in jeopardy now. I think it'll come back around again, you know? Right. I think it's like anything. I think like there, you know, I was just listening to um, Genesis, the lamb, the lamb lies down on Broadway record. The last one they did with Peter Gabriel. And it's like, it's a double album. You know, it's fucking forever. It's like, and, and then I'm like reading about it. I'm like, they did a tour where they played the album in its entirety. I'm like, Jesus Christ. You know, like, it's such a commitment. And then like jump forward 10 years and Genesis is doing like Invisible Touch. And then jump forward 20 years or whatever it is now. And they're on their farewell tour. And they're doing some of the songs from Lamb Lies Down on Broadway again. And like the show's three hours long or whatever, you know, like it all kind of comes around. So I think eventually our, I think our specials will become like, like, like the wall oh, gotcha. where it's like, where it's like, I'm going to do something cool. I'm going to do a fucking hour, you know? And in the meantime, until that comes around again, it's going to be like it's going to be like the like punk records or pop records. Hey, man, I'm in and out in 32 minutes. That's why I like Weezer. Get me in. Get me out. I'm done. You know, like so that's fine. I don't personally there are very few comedians I'd ever want to listen to for an hour. I don't I don't like I make I make my bread and butter off of stand up and podcasting. I, I don't. I never listen to podcasts ever. See, that's the opposite of us is we never listen to music. All yeah. we do is watch comedy podcasts, listen to podcasts in the road. It's, it's hilarious. Like, yeah. You just, you do it all the time. You lo- you want to hear a new great comedian if it's put out, but I'm not searching for the next new great punk band. If I'm alerted to it, I'll check it out. But I, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. I just don't. I, I don't want to sit and watch and, li- you know, I'm just you know, music, though. I do. I, you know, I still go to shows and stuff. So, yeah, it's always. Yeah, that's funny. That's funny that you guys do the same thing. <laughs> OK, so um, we're getting to the hour mark, or actually past the hour mark. So we're going to sure. go soon. But I'm going to I want to ask you, what's the first time you remember hearing about my grandpa, mm-hmm. Willie Nelson? What's your own personal Willie Nelson take or story? It's a. Uh, Oh, it's so funny. The first time I ever heard Willie Nelson, my mom, <laughs> my mom loved Julio and Glacius. Yeah. And they did to all the girls I've loved before together. That's, how, that's, that's how I heard Willie Nelson. And I thought he was a guy that sang that kind of music. Like, <laughs> yeah. I thought he sang a uh, drum machine based adult <laughs> contemporary music. That's funny. Um, um and then what wait, wait what's the second part sorry oh yeah just your own it just makes me laugh that you mentioned that because we asked doug stanhope the same thing like what she asked like what do you remember about my grandpa and he mentioned that song and as soon as he said it, he's like god what a fucking horrible song he started <laughs> shitting on it for like five minutes it was hysterical <laughs> i didn't love it as a kid no i didn't either i don't know if i love, would like it now i've heard it since i was like nine but like <laughs> But anyway, that was my first um, introduction to him. And, you know, it's funny, like you hear the, 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 the most significant um, thing. Oh, oh, actually. And then this is interesting. So you learn eventually that country music is cool. Uh, if you're not from a country music city or town, you usually don't know that it's cool until somebody teaches you that it's cool because all the country you hear is fucking like nothing against Garth Brooks, but it's that kind of country. You know what I mean? Or you turn on the country station and it's Shania Twain and you just think like country is like very polished rock music. And you're like, I don't know, man, it's not for me. Um, And then somebody comes along that goes, you know, country music is cool. 
and you go, what the fuck are you talking about? You know what I mean? Like, it's like kind of like, it's funny in the Norm Macdonald auto, auto or his book that's fiction, but he calls it a memoir. <laughs> My favorite part is when he talks about doing dirty work and he goes, we were looking for a director and somebody suggested Bob Saget. And I said, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> And then he's like, turns out Bob Saget's hilarious, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which he is. Um, was. Was, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. But um, but uh, RIP to Norm and Bob Saget. Yeah. But anyway, that's kind of your reaction when somebody first tells you country music is cool. So Willie Nelson is always the first person they tell you. Mm -hmm. And then Johnny Cash. Yeah. And then you start to get into Hank Williams and all that other stuff. Um. So that's my second, like, significant, like, Willie Nelson memory. And that's when I started to get his music and, and like his music. Um, one of my favorite songs of all time is uh, Willie Nelson and I think Wailing Jennings. Yeah. Um, um, take back the wheat, take back the cocaine, baby. Yeah, we, we cover that. that song. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's one of my favorite songs of all time. Me and my friend Vince Avery will listen to that all the time. Yeah, I he, used to, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I don't want to interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead, please. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to like singing it because it said cocaine and weed and whiskey. And my mom would, you know, just kind of look at me like, mm, but I wanted to sing it. That's why it's I such thought. a great song. And uh, it is Willing Jennings, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, he did it with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's so. Vince timed that once when I lived in L.A., we used to drink at this bar called The Roost, which is a great dive. And I called him one. We we would always put that song in the jukebox. And I called him one day, and he. I was like, "Dude, I got us. Oh, I'm so hungover. I was partying way too hard last night." And he's like, "All right, meet me at the roost, man. We'll try to patch you up." And he timed it so when I walked through the door, that song started. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. And it came on as soon as I walked through the door. I started laughing so hard. But that was like our theme song. We would always. Anyway, so that's that's my third. Willie Nelson thing. But then the fourth thing that I remember most, it, that's probably the most significant is that one. But the thing that I remember is I, when I, when I lived in Texas, uh, I worked for the Senate for a little while for their, for their media department. And, you know, it was like a suit and tie job. It was real stiff stuff. It wasn't for me, but I, I, I had a good time and made some lifelong friends. But anyway, they had a day where they honored Texas artists and I was so excited because they were finally doing something cool in the legislative session. And they're like, they're going to honor Tommy Lee Jones and Willie Nelson today. And Willie Nelson and Tommy Lee Jones are going to come down to the Senate floor and get a medal. And I had access to the Senate floor because I was part of the media department there. And my boss, Barb, who was sort of an old hippie, like kind of rough and tumble Texas lady. She's great. She's like, she's like, Joe, I'm going to take you down to the senator's lounge so you can meet Tommy Lee Jones and Willie Nelson. And I was like, holy shit, <laughs> this is going to be fucking awesome. I wonder if Willie Nelson is going to be high. That's all I kept thinking about all day. I wonder <laughs> if Willie Nelson is going to be high. Anyway, Willie didn't show up. <laughs> I, was gonna say, I can't imagine him going and showing up for that. He didn't show up. It was such a fucking bummer. But I did meet Tommy Lee Jones and I still have a picture. And I remember when I met him, my boss introduced me and she goes, Mr. Jones, this is uh, <laughs> one of our uh, media guys is Joe DeRosa. And I go, hi, Tommy. My name's Joe. And he goes, hi, Joe. I'm Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, what a fucking like Southern gentleman. <laughs> he named. Definitely from the South. That's great. Yeah, he was he was awesome. Um, so those are all my Willie Nelson memories. I, those are some good ones. I those were good. That's, That's probably the best we've had so far. Yeah, yeah. 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 Matt and Doug Stanhope shitting all over him. That was funny too. <laughs> Yeah, that's so funny, man. Um, but yeah, this was fun, guys. Send me that song. I'm going to come. I, I swear to God, I, I, I'm going to come to Nashville just to hang out and I'll play drums with you and yeah. we'll all hang out. Like, it'll just be fun. We'll record it while we're there and we'll just jam some. We'll, we've got your email address, so you can't get off the hook now. We've got no, video, no, no. Proof. video proof. Set, send it to me and I'll reply with my cell and all that. And okay. cool. we'll be uh, 
proper friends. Right on, man. Thanks for doing this. This is a blast. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Thanks, guys. Oh, can I plug my sandwich place? Oh, absolutely. I meant to ask about the sandwich place because yeah. all of the comedians are talking about how badass your sandwich place is. Thanks, man. Um, that's very nice to hear. And thank you. But yeah, we opened a sandwich shop and bar. We call it a social club on the Lower East Side. We have classic old school sandwiches, eight sandwiches for eight bucks a piece. And then we also have some other specialty sandwiches. It's called Joey Rose's Come Through. It's old school. I'm telling you, you'll like it. It's got the vibes of the Lower East Side. It's a place you can hang out, meet and drink and really call like home. You'll talk to the bartender, that kind of spot. It's great. Go to joeyrosesnyc.com for all the details. We're open six days a week, Tuesday through Sunday. Um, and then joederosainfo.com for all my upcoming shows. I got a ton of shit coming up. We'll put some, uh, we'll, we'll put some links everywhere. in the for you. For yeah, sure. I'll put all those links awesome. in our description too. And it sounds awesome. I'm, I'm glad you opened the sandwich shop because it sounds like real bars are kind of going away. And this sounds like one of the bars that we used to go to, you know? That's what we tried to do. So that's the whole, that was the whole point. So please come through if you're ever in New York. Fantastic. I'm hungry now. I know. We're going to have to eat a sandwich. All right. Thanks, guys, Joe. hit me up. I'll talk to you. All right, buddy. Bye. All right. Joe DeRosa is my favorite comedian, probably because he fucked Nicky Blazer. Funny guy and makes a damn good sandwich, apparently. Anyway, that was a blast. We're going to have him on a track and he's going to come to Nashville and become proper friends. Anyway, enjoy your groceries. Don't be an asshole. I know your mama's name. Enjoy your cigarettes.